Hello, I'm Atubo George and I'm so blessed to be bringing God's truth to you today. Praise God. Hey, we're approaching Christmas, just a few days to Christmas Day. Remember to send love to someone in this season. Don't just call on the phone. Send a gift. This is a season to give and to receive. So as you honor the Lord, remember to extend that love physically to those around you. As much as God has blessed you with. If you have little, give that little. If you have much, bless with much. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Can we call for that daily bread? Say this with me with faith in your heart. And I stand in agreement with you. Say, Father, I demand for my daily bread in this season. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. I release by the authority of the Lord angels to assist you today. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Hey, we've been talking about tithes and offerings. And the aspect of offering we've been dealing on this week is first fruit offering. Now, why are we dealing on first fruit offering? We're concentrating on those offerings that still exist till today. And those are the ones God was speaking about when he said in Malachi, will a man rob God? He said, but you have robbed me. How? In tithes and offerings now so it's an instruction from the lord uh, like i told you be careful because some out there are preaching ah these are ways pastors want to eat your money see we addressed that this week those who minister at the temple eat from the temple Paul said, those that uh, leave, preach the gospel must live by the gospel. What does it mean to live by the gospel? So I tell you the truth. Don't accuse any man who's living by the gospel as long as he's a preacher of the gospel. Those that do the service of the temple today, the are workers in church. You see, God has given them rights. Now that's the reason we're we'll going to some details that will really bless you when we start talking about tithes and other things next week. We'll go into those details, but I want you to listen to me. Don't envy a preacher that God has blessed. Really blessed. Now, I'm not talking about a preacher who's a businessman, you know. <laughs> we, we talked about those things, you know, during the course of the week. When a preacher say, I don't depend. It's even shameful for a preacher to say that. Then quit preaching. Quit preaching. No, I'm just trying to let you know that my mind is not on the things you... Hey, truly speaking, if you're called by God, you don't have to prove that to anybody. Because you will know that what sustains you is where your mind is. If your mind is on the people, you will soon get out of business. You know what I mean? You will soon get out of the calling. You will soon get out. So it's not how you try to make people view you. It doesn't matter how they view you. Jesus said, if they hated me, they will hate you also. So there's no point trying to look good or nice to people. Our service is unto the Lord and for the benefit of people. People will insult us. People say all manner of things against us. It is part of the package. If you cannot receive that, then you were not called. You were not called. People will accuse you. They'll say, oh, you're doing this. But make sure, make sure they don't have evidence of your error. I was discussing with my children. And we were, we were doing this. We were, we we're been looking at the book of Acts. So um, we got to that part of Stephen. And of course, they were concerned that Stephen represented God. So how come they killed him? So I, I said, let's look at what was going on. Let's look at the story carefully. So we began to look at the story and then it got to where some people 
thought, look, let's go and argue with Stephen. Because th those men thought they were knowledgeable. So let's go and argue with Stephen. And then they went and Stephen defeated them hands down. And when Stephen defeated them, they said, oh, ah, let's go another step. Let's bring a false accusation against him. And I said to my, this is my, my biological children. So I said to my children, I said, Stephen should have been smart enough at that point to call it a quit. You see, when people don't receive your message, don't stay there. I told my children that Stephen got killed not because Jesus wanted him dead. He got killed because he didn't know when to call it a quit. Jesus himself instructed them, if they don't receive you in this place, flee to another place. You have nothing to prove. You have nothing to prove. Preachers have made this mistake and they suffer bitterly and they call it persecution. Be careful with what you call persecution. John the Baptist died not because of persecution. He died because he went into an arena that he was not commanded by God to go to. He was arrested by Herod because he dabbled into affairs in the private life of Herod. Now, hey, but was he not condemning? It's like today, I, I want you to understand something. It's like today, a preacher calling a politician corrupt. Mm, okay. Now, you think you're being a defender of the people. No, sir. You are not. You know, sometimes people, people speak and say, why are the preachers keeping quiet? You see evil going on. Huh? <laughs> and preachers think, ah, it's true. I think we need to speak up. I think we need to speak up to the government. No, sir. Be careful. You can only speak if God commands you to speak. If God did not command you specific, and when God commands you to speak, he will give you the words to speak. He will tell you when to say it. Yes, he will. If he has not commanded you to speak, and you step out, out of your own passion to speak, whatever you see, is what you get if you are arrested for that purpose and locked up or even killed you didn't die because of persecution you died because of your overzealousness and there is a limited protection that can happen when that is done that's why though john was a man of god a cousin of jesus his head was cut off by the demand of a little girl I don't think that is something God planned for anybody. Nah, there is nothing you're going to tell me to believe that. No, please. Let's not underrate our God. He's much more bigger than that. See? Hello, Makuso, Bradia. What's the preacher supposed to do to the people? He's supposed to bring hope. How do you bring hope? Wait, let me tell you this truth. The nation is different from God's people. As a preacher, your job is to God's people. And, and here's, the, here's the advantage. If you teach God's people the truth and they function in the place of the truth, truly, the nation will become good. But if you leave the teaching of the truth and start becoming a human rights activist, you will leave the place. The nation will not get better. You will have heart attack. You will be imprisoned. Your anointing will not work. It won't work there. It won't work there. Because sometimes we read things in scriptures, we don't know how to apply it. Elijah declared that there will be no rain. Okay, go and declare that there will be no rain in Nigeria. 
when that comes to pass then you know God has honored you but hey Elijah declared that there will be no rain right there was no rain three and a half years then God says go and send down rain they send down rain did the king repent no after that whole experience, before Elijah called down rain, he made a deal with God. He said, Lord, give me permission to deal with these false prophets of Baal. And God gave him. He killed all of them. Jezebel came and said, where is that man? God be to God, God be with if I don't cut off his head today. What happened to the man of God? He ran. He fled for his life. And let me tell you the truth. If he, did not, if he had not run for his life, if he didn't run, his head would have been cut off. Ah, his head would have been cut off because this order was coming from the authority of the king. This is his wife. She will use his authority and deal with him. So he had the wisdom of God. He, a man that called down rain from heaven, a man that said heaven should shut down no rain. One woman challenged him. He was run. I mean, he ran. He went to a he there and said, God, I'm done. I don't want to do it again. Where is all the power that used to stop rain? Can't you command the woman to be blind? It will not work. Uh -huh. You see, even as God's prophets, we have our limitations. We do have our limitations. And so you know your limit according to how God will instruct you as a person. So when we want to pray for a change, here's where the change could come from. The change will not come from out there. The change will not come from the politicians. So we pray for revival of our nation. We start with the house of God. Remember, I said judgment will begin from the house of God. Change will begin from the house of God. And where do you first begin to notice the changes? When God's children begin to set the altars right. Not this rascality you have everywhere. You see, the rascality you have everywhere is the same thing happening in the nation. They don't just come up and say anything they want to say. The church, the church, the church. Okay. We have an obligation to teach God's children. We have an obligation to show them, and that's what I'm doing to you. I don't expect the world to come and pay their first fruits. I'm talking to God's children who have a covenant with Him. And when we begin to practice this obedience, guess what? God will begin to magnify us. God will begin to magnify us. And soon, our authority as the church will cover the nation. That's when men will recognize that of a truth, because the world will get to that place where it will recognize that of a truth, light is in the church. Because they will get to that point where they notice that everything we do, these people are not affected by it. So what is it about these people? Aha! Uh -huh. That's when they are attracted to light. And then we must be ready to give them the light. How do you give them the light? Repent and you shall see the kingdom of heaven. So learn this. We have our place. And don't be ashamed of the Lord your God. If God sends men to bless you, enjoy the blessing. Put the testimony before you. Don't be shy of it. God blesses you with a car, drive it gladly. Even if it's for one week, drive it gladly. You know this is the blessing of the Lord. You did not steal it. You did not labor for it. It is the blessing of the Lord. I'm talking to priests now. I'm talking to men who, who, who do truthfully serve God. And you will notice, you will notice, it doesn't matter. This has nothing to do with the size of your congregation. No, the size of your congregation will never be what will determine the size of harvest that you enjoy or blessing that you enjoy the size of harvest the blessing that you enjoy is connectly directly proportional to your amount or level of obedience to the lord because sometimes we think oh well with that preacher that have 
plenty congregation. Ah! Imagine if everybody in that place gives him, you know, ten ten dollars. Man, he will be very rich. That's not how it works. Trust me, that's not how it works. A man who obeys the Lord can receive a someone will receive a command from the Lord, just like the prof, the, the, the prophet Elisha. A man came and brought his first fruits to them. That man received a command from the Lord. So God knows how to take care of his own servant. He perfectly knows. But when we now begin, now there are, there, are, there are times God will bless you so much that naturally the blessing that God has given you will flow. If, for example, God starts blessing you with estates, you get to that point and someone says, hey, but why don't you sell it or give it out? See, the problem is sometimes when you give it out, it multiplies. So you have, still have trouble. So you get to that point where it goes into something like a business. Now, this is not you going to borrow money from the bank and saying, I want to go into real estate. This is you receiving the blessing from the Lord. And you're like, oh, come, I have 10 houses. What am I doing with 10 houses? Okay, um, let me, oh, I can't stay in no. all. Okay, let me get people to occupy it and pay rent. So you get someone, say, please, I want you to be in charge of these houses. Take rent from them. And this is what I'm going to give you. And make sure what you get from it, you let me know this is what you get. Why do you do that? So you can concentrate on the work. But when you are now the one, ah, I need to get, you will get distracted. And the moment you start getting distracted, the Lord pulls his hands from it. And one day disaster happened. Phew, houses burnt. You're wondering what happened. How did they get burnt? Don't start claiming big mouth, I will build them again. No, why did they get burnt in the first place? Be careful with these things that we do. The job we do for the Lord is a holy job. Very holy job. And he determines what we get by the kind of instructions he gives to us and we obey him. No man, I speak to you as priests. If you will honestly serve the Lord, He will bless your bread and your waters. You don't have to cut corners. You don't have to cheat people. You don't have to lie to people. You don't have to claim, oh, you know, sometimes, oh, let's, let's do a big bogus project. So when people really give, the rest I can use it. No, you don't have to. Don't get, don't fall under the pressure of ministry to do evil or unrighteousness. Don't. Be sincere before the Lord. Be very sincere before the Lord and search in Him. Search inside Him. He will open a door for you. There is great blessing in serving the Lord wholeheartedly. There is great blessing in serving the Lord. And there are, there are ministers of God who do business and use the business money to run the kingdom of God. God will never accept such sacrifices. Never. Never, never, trust me, never. You might look big today, but a day will come, if you're genuine, a day will come when God will want to purify your work. And that day you may lose everything. Can you stand at that season? You're not losing so that he wants to, because he wants to humiliate you. No, you will lose it so that he can now bring his own, so he can accept the fruit of your work. You can't retire from a business or from a job and carry all your benefits and go and buy equipment and put in the ministry. Uh -uh, it doesn't work that way, sir. It doesn't. Your retirement benefit is your own. Give God the tithe. Give him his offerings. The rest is yours to enjoy. You don't carry all that and say you want to do ministry with it and call it a sacrifice. Now, now God can instruct you see that now he can instruct you to do that just like he told that rich and go sell everything i give to the poor then come and follow me but even god instructing you that most likely hear me i'll tell you this truth he will never tell you 
to go sell all your benefit and buy equipments for the church. He will never tell you to do that. He may tell you, go give out everything. Give out, give out. You're not connected to the benefit of those things. I know him enough. And I'll tell you the truth about him. He will never tell you, all your retirement benefit, now that you're retired, take all your benefit and go and start the ministry. Ah, hey, okay, Lord. Ah, I have, my benefit is 20 million. So I'll get a hall, get a land, I'll buy equipment, buy a truck, start ministry. That ministry will fail. It will fail. Not because God did not call you, but because God will never accept that kind of sacrifice. Even if you pray about it, I've told you what God can command you to do is to give it out. Then watch him begin to bring everything that you need. I pray your, the, the Lord opens you up to this truth. And I pray that the Lord show you mercy where you need mercy. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you. I'll see you next week. Bye.